Hey you, it's me, V, assistant editor of Media Mementos. You may also know me as the creator of MK, the silhouette who welcomes you to her little corner in the shadow realm. For those of you who don't know, Animaniacs 1993 is my favorite show of all time. It's ridiculously funny, unique, has heart, is filled to the brim with a lovable cast of characters and their many different variety sketches, sends a love letter to the bygone rubber hose era of animation as well as programs like the Rocky and Bullwinkle show, and dare I say it, it's the best show to come out of the 90s, only rivaled by South Park. It's how I found my calling and realized I wanted to work in the animation industry someday. So imagine my delight when Warner Brothers confirmed that an Animaniacs reboot was going to happen in a couple of years. I think an Animaniacs revival could work really well. Sure, there are quite a few shows and even video games that emulate the Animaniacs style of humor, but it's the characters themselves that elevate the concept. More details were slowly but surely revealed, and although many were skeptical with these revelations, I still held on to my hope that it would defy the odds and be the next DuckTales 2017. I was wrong. Don't let the surprisingly fluid animation fool you. There's so much ugliness lying deep inside this reboot. Even when I tried to hold on to the good parts of it, the bad things aged worse and worse with each passing day. How bad, you ask? Well, for every one step forward, Animaniacs 2020 takes three steps back. I've discussed the first two seasons separately on my channel, the first being horribly outdated and the second being my unscripted thoughts about the four and a quarter episodes I managed to sit through, so this is gonna be a little different. Instead, I'm organizing everything I feel about Animaniacs 2020 into one clear picture. It's time to once and for all dissect this twisted reboot and reveal why its problems make it broken beyond repair. So first, let's discuss the criteria of a reboot, because Animaniacs 2020 has a bit of an identity crisis. A reboot is a complete revamping of a product with new continuity, as in, a universe separate from the original work. Think DuckTales 2017, or She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. They have different things going for them in story and characters, retooling them either a little or a lot depending on what they see fit. Animaniacs 2020 is more of a revival, explicitly taking place in the same continuity. So the drastic changes they make here are much more jarring than if they would have started from scratch like reboots traditionally do. And either way, I have to judge Animaniacs 2020 by comparing it to Animaniacs 1993, because reboot or revival, a key element that made the good ones succeed was the effort behind them and the passion the crew had for the original. The best place to start is with the characters themselves. We have five principal returning characters, Yakko, Wacko, Dot, Pinky, and Brain. Each of them fall short to some extent, whether it be just barely or to the point where they're not even themselves anymore. In Animaniacs 1993, Yakko is the oldest Warner sibling and default leader. He's confident, smooth, unapologetically witty, and as his name suggests, he's known for running his mouth a mile a minute and coming up with most of the show's best quips. You can teach an old dog new tricks, but you can't teach Madonna to act. Do you know who I am? Why, did you forget? I will not have this broadcast interrupted by a bunch of little kids. We protest you calling us little kids. We prefer to be called vertically impaired pre-adults. There's still a fair share of that in episodes like That's Not the Issue and France France Revolution. This is the problem with being rich. Your only other nickname is Dick. But otherwise, it's a rare treat. Now he's a blank slate for the writers to mold into whatever fits the plot. The reason why is one we'll get to soon. He also goes against his original character in Fear and Laughter in Burbank, apparently being insecure about his ability to be funny and almost dying to the Pennywise XP who feeds off of people's fears. What the hell was that? That trait doesn't add to his character because it contradicts how he's supposed to be the real deal. Compared to Wacko's Wish, where his heartwarming moments expand upon an already strong bond between the Sibs, this feels like it was added to fuel the angsty fanfiction writers. Next we have Wacko. In 1993, he was slow but also a genius. The more nonsensical humor comes from him, and he's typically the first to use his weapons for slapstick antics. He's the most consistent in Animaniacs 2020, not much changing aside from him possibly becoming stupider and more willing to swear despite one of his most iconic lines claiming it wasn't a nice thing to do. Do you swear? Yes! Well, you shouldn't. It's not nice. Ooh, I think he meant up, and then I thought you were in hell. Also, his eating stuff routine has been taken away twice and given to Yakko. The first time it was meant to be a joke. The second was for a gag without a punchline. Aha. And the industrial meat grinder? What? I don't get it. 
What's the joke? <laughs> Wacko gets his revenge against the first one by claiming Yakko can't do math and gold medlers, contradicting the multiplication song. Finally, we have Dot. In 2020, she hates men for no reason. It's a he, I'm busy. Never mansplaining. I don't need a mansplaining song about manspreading. Now, woman knows why the right man for the job is always a woman. Stop it. Get some help. And her defining trait is now wit rather than cuteness. It's all gone! They've taken it all! Why are they doing this? This is the result of the crew wanting Dot to be a feminist icon, except 1993 Dot was already a feminist icon. I've seen people criticize the original Dot for being a shallow character and having no personality outside of taking pride in her cute looks, making her just the girl. But none of that is true. Right off the bat, I can name at least five different traits that don't mention her cuteness. She's sassy, short-tempered, cunning, headstrong, and willing to beat up anyone who looks at her brothers the wrong way. Dot may seem like the one sane person of the trio based on her disapproval of the Hello Nurse routine, but she's just as crazy. She makes blunt remarks but covers them up in a sugary, sweet, and innocent tone to provide a bigger punch when she drops the facade. Dot knows she's cute and uses that charm to get everybody wrapped around her little finger, because unlike Yakko and Wacko, her capabilities are unexpected. The poor saps who fall into her trap don't realize what they've gotten themselves into until it's too late. Put it all together, and it makes her not just the secret weapon, but also the most dangerous threat of the trio. That's powerful stuff, and even though the reboot sometimes allows her to do the uncute thing, they can't have their cake and eat it too. It doesn't work anymore because her true nature is always at the forefront. There's nothing to sugarcoat her brattiness, so what you see is what you get. The crew misunderstood what made Dot so great, and instead gave off the impression that a girl can only be strong if she puts down men for not being women at any opportunity she gets while stealing her brother's personality and routines. Oh yeah, when she's not being a misandrist, she's taken almost everything from Yakko. From small-scale things like the paddle ball, to large-scale things like ripping off his Masterpiece Theater parody, getting the lion's share of songs in Season 1, being extra wordy, her new defining trait being something heavily associated with Yakko, and having more opportunities for roasts such as her grilling Cora Norita which bears a striking resemblance to Yakko burning How We Turn, these things don't go easily unnoticed. At least Yakko only stole the eating stuff thing from Wacko twice, Dot's Yakko 2.0 syndrome never goes away, and it only becomes more prominent in Season 2 as her misandrous streak supposedly comes to an end. It's a downgrade in every way, and makes two out of three Warner siblings weak. Oh, also, it's kind of obvious at this point, but Yakko and Wacko are not allowed to do the Hello Nurse routine on women anymore, nor flirt with them, because the gag is commonly mistaken for making light of sexual harassment. But for some reason, Dot who, need I remind you, has been turned into a man-hater, is still allowed to flirt with her enemies and even calls Chris Pine hot at some point. Not only is it really weird that they decided to have the nine-year-old, the youngest one of the bunch, continue to flirt with other guys, but sometimes they'll take the joke way too far and they cross a boundary that even 1993 was too smart to cross. They make the adult target into it. What if Tuck Buck was your true love? Step away from the underage girl. Things aren't looking too good for them. But trust me, it only gets worse from here. Be afraid. Be very afraid. What about the laboratory mice whose genes have been spliced? They're better. Pinky's more consistent with his 1993 incarnation, but like Dot has a minor tendency to do things that should have been done by Yakko, such as playing Genie in Brain's Aladdin parody and rapping a parody of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme. Brain is also fairly consistent, except his morals have gone unchecked. Brain had standards in both Animaniacs and the Pinky and the Brain spinoff, but now he's willing to do some pretty nasty things, whether they be in his attempts to take over or in his plans after world domination. It's jarring to watch, since it used to be implied before being outright stated in the Christmas special that Brain wants to take over the world so he can make it a better place. Ralph and Scratch and Sniff return as well as Chicken Boo, but they don't do much. What happened with Chicken Boo was really bizarre, I don't have much to say about Ralph, and the way Scratch and Sniff's first appearance was handled ruined Hindenburg Cola for me. Despite how prominent his relationship with the Warners was, they don't reunite until the season finale, where they discover he's sick and they go to get the titular drink so he can feel better. However, when they get back, Scratch and Sniff flies off the rails and revels in tricking the Warners, not actually being sick. 
He comes off as very vindictive and spiteful despite having come to see the trio as his sons and daughter. It's surprisingly mean-spirited. As for the new characters, they range from fun to lacking. The troll guy from the intro makes a few appearances, but he's insufferable. Eggwin is a funny running gag. Julia is interesting as Brian's new archenemy, yet she appears only once per season. Nils Needheart is a surprisingly funny foe, although his first appearance shows that Hello Nurse's removal from the show was downright hypocritical. And although new CEO Nora Norita can banter with the Warners, she's completely underutilized throughout the first season. Also, her daughter Cora is a brat. Two completely new segments are made too. Starbucks and Cindy, and the incredible gnome in people's mouths. The first surrounds an alien trying to escape the clutches of a little girl, and the second is about a gnome who sneaks into the mouths of the defenseless and speaks up for them. While Starbucks and Cindy has no flair, the incredible gnome is so bizarre and out there that it kinda works. Too bad both only get one appearance per season. The characters may not sound too promising now, but maybe the stories make up for it? Not consistently. This is something I stand by with my initial take. Even though there's so much that doesn't work, when they get it right, they really get it right. That's Not the Issue is easily the best Warner skit of the reboot's run. It's smaller scale, with the trio appearing on a Tuck Buckerson show and spouting non-sequitur issues to discuss. Ralph Cam is a close second, showing security footage of Ralph sleeping while the Warners battle a vampire. The whole thing is silent aside from the occasional fast-forwarding noises of the tape, and it easily could have failed and turned awkward, but thankfully I could hear how much I was laughing, so the risk paid off. The Pinky and the Brain skits are generally fun as well, feeling like updated versions of the 1993 and spin-off episodes. Notice how I made only two examples of the Warner skits while mentioning Pinky and the Brain as a whole? It's because the show only gets it right 30% of the time, and most of the 60% that consists of painful mediocrity or downright abysmal content comes from the Warners. They were my absolute favorites in the original show, and it's devastating to see how their track record becomes a train wreck while the Pinky and the Brain segments are more consistently good. I bet you're wondering, how much of a train wreck are the Warner skits? Well, most of them equate to setups with no payoff. One of the biggest offenders is Bun Control. Yakko starts the episode by singing one line of a song about Giuseppe Archimboldo before being cut off by the doorbell. I'm glad you asked, wacko. In 16th century Italy... Ah, I guess the song will have to wait. It never comes back. Now the children will never hear my educational song about Italian mannerist portrait artists. And it's better than the rest of the songs the reboot has to offer in season one. Anyway, a bunny salesman named Dwayne La Pistol sells the Warners some buns, and the innuendo has absolutely no subtlety. Just came by to introduce myself and show you my buns. Good night, everybody. The buns multiply like crazy the next morning, which opens the door to some fun opportunities. Will the Warners become the king, prince, and princess of the buns? Will they lead the bun army to wreak havoc across the Warner Brothers movie lot? Nope. They're terrified and allow themselves to be beneath such old-fashioned tendencies. Nobody is happy, and Dwayne won't take the buns back because he thinks everybody has a right to bear buns, which means it's his right to force buns onto everybody. The Warners then see Nora for help, but she doesn't even banter with them and instead gives it to them straight. I'm not going to tell anyone that they can or can't have one. It's in the Constitution. Do you know how to spell stupid? Y-O-U. She refuses to do anything about the Bunz's overpopulation despite it having the power to shut down the Warner Brothers movie lot and cost them a profit so big it could make the company go bankrupt. Now, I'm gonna stop here for a minute and explain something from Bun Control that many Animaniacs 2020 plots often do to the Warners to make them collectively more broken than they already were. They're more prone to frustration and would rather complain and demand the enemy stops than kick butt and take names. Animania and Warner She Wrote stand out in particular for Season 1, while Season 2 takes their submissiveness to another level. Who are you? Even when they have opportunities for zany slapstick antics, sometimes they just kinda stand there and do something minuscule as best exemplified in Rome Sweet Rome and Everyday Safety. The Warners also have a recurring theme of turning into straight men because of how chaotic the world has become. Instead of reigning in the zany antics and becoming unstoppable forces of insanity, they're easily defeated by their adversaries and instead end up bringing order, which goes against everything these characters stand for. 
episodes such as Look at the Fuzzy Heads, Baloney and Kids, and Chairman of the Board are the norm rather than the exception, complete with most of the enemies being unhinged lunatics instead of sticks in the mud, which in turn takes away why those episodes were funny apart from the clever writing. The Warners are being changed to adjust to the stories the writers want to tell when it should be the stories that need to accommodate for the characters. Back to the episode, the Warners take matters into their own hands and become anime versions of themselves. This was one of the most hyped up scenes from the first trailer, and yes, it looks beautiful. However, this doesn't automatically make it a good scene. When you see this, you probably think the Warners are gonna engage in epic combat against Dwayne, right? Perhaps even parodying some famous animes like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and Fist of the North Star. Maybe even ghost stories considering its Animaniac-style humor. Instead, the Warners instantly get their butts kicked. Dot doesn't even get to use her weapon before Dwayne beats the kawaii out of her. That's it? THAT WAS JUST A BUNCH OF CHEAP WALK CYCLES! The anime segment was gorgeous, but ultimately had no substance to back it up, making it a major waste of budget and a huge letdown. After their humiliating defeat, the Warners call some dingoes from Australia to handle the buns, and Wacko is too dumb to realize the episode was a heavy-handed metaphor for guns. I'm proving to the world we all have a right to bear buns! Not here. This is a kid's show. All in all, bun control feels like a first draft, and it could have been easily fixed if the writers were allowed to. That's the vibe I get from the first season overall. So many episodes feel underwhelming when they could have been stellar if they just made a couple of rewrites. For instance, Animaniac falls flat because of the outdated Russian satires and the Warners once again barking more than they bite. It's so strange because the Warners totally would have been, or pretended to be, flattered if they discovered someone bootlegged them and insist they help make the bootleg even more glorious, their chaotic tendencies eventually making the bootleggers back off. This issue even plagued Here Comes Treble, an episode I used to like but not anymore. It's somewhat better in that it allows the Warners to fight back much earlier, but one of the ways the conductor tortures the Warners in the beginning of the skit is by muting them. For a brief moment, Yako is terrified at not being able to talk, but he and the others quickly shrug off that part of their predicament. What? This is Yako Warner we're talking about, the guy who yaks. Losing his voice should be treated as a big deal. That should have been its own episode. I should know, I wrote a fanfic about that years ago and rewrote it to fix the poor execution and wasted potential. Notice how I haven't been talking about Pinky and the Brain a lot? Well, it's because as much as I like them, I can't watch them the same way I watch the Warners. You know how 95% of the original Animaniacs cast was cut from the reboot? The reason that variety sketch format worked was because it didn't allow me to be fatigued by getting too much of something that I liked but didn't love. Since the Warners were the poster children and a consistent highlight, they always got at least one skit per episode aside from Spellbound, One Flew Over the Cuckoo Clock, and the last Christmas episode. But then the other skits would be spaced out, so you have to wait around three or four episodes in order to see Pinky and the Brain, Slappy Squirrel, or the Good Feathers again. It's a good balance, and I never feel tired of seeing anybody. Well, except Buttons and Mindy, because I feel bad for Buttons. Without that structure, Pinky and the Brain becomes exhausting to watch, and combined with my resentment over them getting treated better than the Warners in 2020, I have nothing to say other than it's mostly good and a consistent highlight of the reboot. Speaking of everybody being gone, this gets addressed in Good Warner Hunting. At first, it's a really fun episode, and the Warners get to do a Looney Tunes-style routine. But then the Hunter captures them and reveals he killed them all. It's a frightening reveal. Even Farfig Newton, the love of Pinky's life, couldn't escape his clutches. When trying to figure out why, the Warners realize the Hunter is Chicken Boo in disguise, resenting his status as the least liked Animaniacs character, even though Katie Kaboom and the Hip Hippos exist. I personally don't hate any of them, but they work a lot better in the ensemble skits than as the stars of their own segments. Also, I refuse to believe that Katie Kaboom would be invited back, but not Chicken Boo. Like, Katie Kaboom definitely had the worst skits in the entire show. Anyway, Chicken Boo horrifically shreds his disguise and proceeds to be chased by the freed Animaniacs cast. 
I'm not fond of the turn they took, but it has even more unfortunate implications when you learn about what was going on behind the scenes. As much as I believe many of these episodes could have been fixed, some were already bad ideas on paper, such as a zit and Manny Manspreader. The latter in particular was destined to be horribly dated the minute they came up with that idea. You know what else in Animaniacs 2020 won't age well? The humor. Sure, some episodes have one big funny haha -ha moment such as Yakko's innuendo and in France France Revolution, but Animaniacs 2020 also had some gross out humor, most of which occurring in the Warner skits. Oh joy. I know Animaniacs 1993 had some gross humor like Wacko's potty emergencies and burping concerts as the great Wackorati, but they were cleverly written, genuinely funny, and not an assault on all five senses the same way the Warners licking a pigeon's pus-filled eyeball, Dot's monkey paw, the whole Azit song, and the close-up on Marie Antoinette's crusty cuticles were. Ah! That's not funny! There's also a bigger emphasis on political humor, which gets worse when it feels one-sided most of the time and appears to target the Republicans more often than the Democrats. Oh, speaking of, that's a criticism about the criticism Animaniacs 2020 often gets. It was already done in the original, so I must be making a mountain out of a molehill, except it's not about what's being done, it's about how it's being done. Yes, Animaniacs 1993 had political humor too, but it was evenly balanced, well-written, and happened sparingly while the pop culture parodies took center stage. Not only are the Republicans targeted more often in Animaniacs 2020, but they also poke fun at the Russians, using Soviet stereotypes. That hasn't been relevant in decades. The same thing was said about the Season 2 sneak peek showcasing the 80s Cats segments. Yes, the Warners have done parodies of old pop culture relics in 1993, but at least they didn't sexualize the 9 and 14 year olds. It's clear Yakko's supposed to be Lionel from Thundercats, but combined with his anime design getting a ton of muscles, it feels icky to me. What the hell is that? Meanwhile, Dot is nothing short of appalling because she's still a 9 year old who now has an adult woman's physique complete with boobs. But if you touch me or even get near me, I'll have you arrested. And I thought Powerpuff Girls 2016 was the lowest point. If Helenurs and Minerva Mink were written off the show for being too sexy and enabling sexual harassment even though the joke is that Yakko and Wacko are young kids and just having harmless fun, then Dot should not be looking like this at all. It was also very irresponsible for the Animaniacs 2020 Twitter account to retweet that lewd fan art of 80s cats Dot. Nope, stop talking, go to jail. Further, there's a short-lived running gag involving Yakko not being allowed to sing. It happens in Bun Control and Manny Manspreader, and it was never funny. It just made me annoyed and angry. Season 2 drops this gag and delivers on Yakko's show-stopping vocals, but it's too little too late. Now that we've covered characters, episodes, and humor, I think this is the perfect time to talk about the songs. Starting with the theme song, of course they change Dot's verse to not so subtly say, This isn't Dot, this is Yakko 2.0 and she's a gaslight gatekeep girl boss. After that, they change a few lyrics to accommodate for almost all the original characters being removed and the changing times. Our careers have made comebacks is a good substitute for while Bill Clinton plays the sax, but the fourth verse... Yikes. Starting at the line about good feathers and slappy to having no script so I bother to rehearse, the lyrics become a brand new cast who tested well in focus group research, gender balance, pronoun neutral, and ethically diverse. The trolls will say we're so passe but we did meta first. The intro has visuals to make the gender pronoun race thing appear tongue in cheek, but when isolated it's just not fun to sing. The variable verses don't work either. Most of the time whoever's singing it sounds off key. I'm not expecting Dana Delaney levels of greatness every time. Not even 1993's variable verses made me laugh often. But those don't ruin the small amount of charm they should have. As for the other songs, they're always so close yet so far. The only ones that work completely being from the first episode. As for the others, some of them have really good beats but weak lyrics or vocals. Even ones I used to like eventually became mediocre because the bad outweighed the good. Suffragette City, for example, starts as a song about women's rights until Dot realizes cartoons don't have rights and they march for their own recognition. The beat is really good, but the lyrics are lackluster and don't have anything witty or funny in them. 
Every day we're smashed and whack. Every day we're smashed and whack. It's time to take our anvils back. It's time to take our anvils back. Pie for you, a pie for me. A pie for you, a pie for me. This is crazy quality. This stuff is crazy quality. Dot's vocals also don't sound very powerful. Staying in her lower range lessens her ability to provide that umph and help carry out her dull advocation. We besiege the legislatures to secure our zany stature, squirrely tail entwined with Tweety Wing. Hear our voices as we sing! That doesn't even sound like Dot Warner. Why does she sound like that? And in To Be Like Me, the Warners' harmonies are flat. To be like us, it doesn't take much fun. And just like us, it's really all black and white. You just gotta be yourself. Don't copy someone else. Cause we need you is a thing that like alike. Don't get me started on Gift Rapper. The powerline looking guy hammers in how the Warners are has beens and wannabes while Yakko's flow isn't as good as it should have been. Listen to this. Yeah, I'm zanier than Billy, to the max, leader of the animated maniacs. You, you're the cure for insomniac. Weak. The flow is so slow and choppy. The lyrics not doing any favors either. It would have been so much more epic if he destroyed the dude rap god style. With the speed being fast enough for Yakko to run his mouth faster than ever before. Also, I have extra beef with this line. We don't need to boast or roast or talk smack. Oh, really? Then explain why most of the best lines from Animaniacs 1993 are them roasting, boasting, and talking smack. This is just as bad as Yakko saying his Spanish is muy terrible, even though the Macadamia Nut song says otherwise. If I had to pick the worst song from season 1, it would either be The Cutening or Flotus Flotus. The former is not only an eyesore coupled with obnoxious pop, but also features none of the original voice actors and instead is completely sung by their doubles. It's been four weeks, we can't stop singing, and we still be got insane. There's a gumdrop wrapped in rainbows where they used to be my brain. We have to end this nightmare, I have sugar in my eye. I can somewhat understand Rob Paulson having a voice double because he was recovering from stage 4 throat cancer when they started production, but it still feels like a ripoff when the Warners aren't actually singing. Meanwhile, the latter is a letdown because Dot is still being a nasty man-hater, the beat is weak, and Dot has to rush through the First Ladies even though the President's song from the original had none of these issues and is still one of the best songs of the original show. Congratulations! You managed to make something that's both misandrist and misogynistic. Now no one's happy. Also, Dot missed one of the first ladies. That's not funny. That's just lazy and leaves a very bitter taste as the last segment of the season. A dishonorable mention goes to Azit. The only reason I don't consider it the worst song of the reboot is because although the lyrics are atrocious and the visuals are pretty disgusting as well, its melody is at least nice to listen to, although that's not a high compliment considering that they straight up took the melody from I'm Mad. Azit, Azit, oh yes that's it, we must admit it's going on you. I want pancakes, or awful, this tastes awful, is that? All we've got. It's so sad season 1 had to be painfully mediocre. They had so much promise, but they only used it to make Pinky and the Brain shine while turning the Warners away from almost any opportunity they had to be funny. I know people tend to say, it's only the first season, who cares if it's mediocre? They'll give us the actually good stuff in the second season. But that's not the approach we should take. It's important to have standards because the more we consume trash in the hopes of it suddenly turning into treasure one day, the more it convinces creators and networks that they don't have to try on their first round because an audience is guaranteed either way. Think about the lasting negative impact that could leave on the entertainment industry. Plus, when Animaniacs 1993 premiered, it was lightning in a bottle and kept hitting all the targets. Of course, not every show can have such a strong beginning and may need some time to find its footing. That's perfectly fine, but I still think they should be offering good content from the start, something to at least hook you in before they fully blossom into something incredible. Animaniacs 2020 was pretty much the opposite. It had a good first episode, but quickly went downhill afterwards and never found a consistent streak. Like I said earlier, every step forward is followed by three steps back. That's why when I gave Animaniacs 2020 a second chance, I did so very warily. Admittedly, I saw this coming, but season 2 worsened my opinion on the show. The animation had a huge downgrade and the season took way too long to improve. 
The second and third skits in the first episode have one chuckle-worthy moment while being otherwise boring to watch. And the first segment, while making me smile once or twice, isn't much better. In Rome Sweet Rome, the song the villain sings is a parody song ripped straight from the original that's nowhere near as funny or good, and even Wacko says it was better in 1993. So what was the point? To be lazy and hope people still laugh? The last segment of the episode doesn't go anywhere either because Wacko's reactions are not over the top and crazy enough except for that one shot of him having a giant muscular arm. That's the only thing that got a genuine laugh out of me. The second episode's Please Submit isn't boring, but it sure is appalling. Spam emails suddenly enter the real world, the Warners only fight back like twice, and their fear as well as demises are played completely straight. Dot being run over by a car, Wacko being stuffed inside a shredder, and Yakko being buried alive are not even portrayed as overdramatic, they're as horrifying as possible. It only felt more infuriating to watch when the end revealed it was just a PSA, and the Warners then proceeded to act all zany and tell the audience to subscribe to their own suspicious website to be protected from spam emails and viruses. The joke isn't funny because the way they behaved in the end is what we should have gotten throughout the whole episode. It's like they forgot this is supposed to be a comedy show and added that ending to remedy that mistake at the last minute. Just play Deltarune instead. It can write Animaniacs episodes way better than Animaniacs 2020. Afterwards, we get a Pinky and the Brain skit where they parody various different sitcoms and it feels like it should have been a Warner skit. I know parodies aren't exclusive to the Warners, but it worked best when they took the lead while the characters from the other skits were team players, and it generally fit their brand of humor much better than Pinky and the Brains. Especially when you consider that the reboot does nothing with their other skit replacements, not even mentioning them in the theme song, and they don't cross over a single time, so it makes it jarring when they dump some of the most fitting Warner as parody ideas to Pinky and the Brain. The third episode's a slight improvement with an actually fun song, but is ruined by an auctioneer acting more like Yakko than Yakko himself and Dot's monkey paw. It wasn't funny the first time, and it wasn't funny a second time. Scratch and Sniff makes another appearance as a more traditional father figure this time, but his lines sound phoned in until he sings about a monster that could steal the Warners' toes. They take the cliché, parents were lying to teach their kids a lesson, but it turns out the monster is real route when it would have worked so much better if the Hamburg Ticklar was actually the Warners getting even. Interestingly, as the Warner skits slowly start to improve, the Pinky and the Brain skits slowly become not as good. Animaniacs 2020 doesn't know how to balance the content and feels one has to be put down to make the other look better, when in reality that sacrifice is unnecessary. Both can thrive without one taking a major drop in quality. I mean, have they even seen the original? Finally, my Super Sour 16 is probably as good as it gets, and it's not that good. Nora hires the Warners to perform at Korra's 16th birthday party, they're heavily auto-tuned, and as usual, the Warners are powerless and can't do anything to fight back against Korra chewing out everyone who set up the party until Dot finally goes morning malaise on her. After the party is trashed, Korra is apparently sympathetic now, and the band she wanted shows up to fix the Warners' leak. It's the main reason they even agreed to work with Nora. This is followed by a Pinky and the Brain skit with the premise that, once again, feels like it should have gone to the Warners. Those three becoming internet celebrities makes more sense than Pinky, especially considering the bloop skit from the first season. The execution is terrible here. I found Pinky so frustratingly annoying that I decided I finally had enough. But then I learned about Yakko Amako, a parody of the Daffy Duck cartoon Duck Amuck, and saw some screenshots detailing a scene that didn't sit right with me. So I decided to check it out to see if it was as rotten as it seemed. This was the last straw. The episode that broke me. Yakko Amako is the perfect example of everything wrong with Animaniacs 2020. It's not funny, it's not zany in the slightest, it's lazy, makes the Warner of Focus powerless, shows a blatant disregard for the original show when Yakko says, I thought we were past this, after the animator turns him back into his 1993 design and reinforcing it with the animator's behavior in the end. And Yakko even speaks the truth at some point, aware of how Animaniacs 2020 turned him into a hollow shell of his former self and gave everything Thing he had to dot. How about I go back to being the rapier wit who carries this whole operation? Me too, Yakko. Me too.
Remember when I said Good Warner hunting was even harsher with behind-the-scenes knowledge? Well, Yako Amako is the culmination of that gigantic issue. You see, when the Animaniacast reviewed Good Warner hunting, they revealed that aside from returning executive producer Steven Spielberg, the reboot executives didn't like the original show. One of them would even mock it for its lame characters. What little hope I had left for Animaniacs 2020 was futile because as long as those guys were in charge, it was doomed from the start. They have no passion. They don't care about what they're doing. And their disdain corrupted Animaniacs 2020, turning what should have been a love letter to one of the most iconic cartoons of all time into a middle finger. Tom Ruger, the original creator, wasn't even allowed to come back. All because Hulu thought it was cheaper to hire anyone other than the right kind of people because they must spend less money to make more money. You know, it's amazing. You are 100% wrong. I mean, nothing you've said has been right. They may have gotten Rob, Jess, Tress, Maurice, Steven, and Randy Rogel back, but it was out of obligation. Tom was never in their minds, not even as a creative consultant, because the people in charge wanted to screw over fans of the original. As stated earlier, Yako and Mako continues to prove their spitefulness when Yako fights back against the animator lady. He pulls her in and almost hits her with the oversized pen, but she suddenly goes, Oh, Yako, please have mercy on me! I'm pathetic, my life sucks, and torturing cartoon characters is the only way I can cope! Also, you're my favorite. And he actually lets her go as long as she does one favor for him that somehow doesn't involve putting her in a humiliating light. The thing is, her treatment of Yako is quite messed up, since in this universe, cartoon characters are sentient living beings, so if Yako didn't spare her, it would have been completely warranted and, dare I say it, a better ending. The way the animator behaves makes it clear that when not pandering to political correctness under the disguise of dismantling it, the show panders to people like her. In doing so, they've slowly but surely sucked out the comedy and life that made Animaniacs 1993 timeless and amazing. Is it any wonder why I, a fan of the original, felt alienated? Like I said in the beginning, Animaniacs 1993 was how I found my calling to go into the animation industry. It changed my life, and to see Animaniacs 2020 mercilessly destroy it breaks my heart. I am angry! Animaniacs 2020 is fundamentally broken, and even though it gives off the illusion of improving, it's too late. It shouldn't take over 17 episodes, which, mind you, is eight and a half hours of watch time, to provide consistently good content if what I've heard from the fans who stuck around longer is true. A third season is set to come out very soon, but with the true colors of the people in charge revealed, nothing can be done to fix the show. As long as the money keeps rolling in, the show won't go past the bare minimum. Even if it accidentally gets a few things right along the way, it won't be enough. It will never be enough. And now I can only hope that this doesn't become Animaniacs' legacy. Now that I've compiled everything wrong with Animaniacs 2020 in one place, I'm turning away from this reboot and never looking back. So, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed what I had to say! And Trevor, Billy, thank you so much for having me. Until next time, this is V, putting the V in Lovely Lively V, and signing off. Good night, everybody! Hey folks, it's Trevor. I wasn't in this video in case you can't tell. But what'd you think? Would you like to have our assistant editor be in more videos? If so, comment below and let us know and we can make it happen. I always love these guest star videos, quote unquote, you know, like the Magic Railroad one and now this. And no, not just because they don't have to do any real work, it's because, honestly, it's kind of something new, kind of something exciting. Maybe someday we'll even expand into crossovers, who knows? On the screen right here are our Patreon executive producers, we love them so. If you would like to be just like them and have your name be listed at the end of every Media Mementos video, then there's a link in the description that links you to our Patreon page, and hey, why not consider donating? Doesn't cost a whole lot. Thanks for watching, folks, and I'll see you guys next time!